Good evening, everyone. Happy Tuesday, Miss Deborah. Ooh, what's my hair doing? Oh, I got crazy hair at the end of the day. How has everyone's day been so far? I did have a good weekend. Yes, I had a nice weekend. It wasn't a short weekend, technically, but it sometimes feels like one. Hello, Miss Laura. How are you this evening? All right. Oh, good. Finally sunny and dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really, really cold here this morning, but then it ended up becoming like 60 degrees. It was really nice by the afternoon. So I guess I can't really complain about that. <laughs> All right. So we'll give this a few more minutes, give folks some time to catch up and sign in and join. Um, on the East Coast. <clears throat> We're here on the East Coast. Wait, what was the question? to make sand angels <laughs> um hmm as long as it's consensual i suppose <laughs> oh you're in virginia okay oh gulf coast nice 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 Sand angels. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get any snow this year to make snow angels up here. Which, at this point, I'm fine. We're in the middle of March, so no snow. So it's it's okay. Indiana? Okay. All right, so do we, or snow ice cream. Oh my gosh, I haven't had snow ice cream since I was a kid, at least. Or honey ice. I think we used to, we used to, I think we used to call it honey ice. Or, oh, he stole your, oh. Girl, that's your blood. You 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 handle business however you feel it's appropriate. So go for it. Snow ice cream. Now when my sister and I were kids, one winter we I think it was we either took honey or we took maple syrup and went out and like spread it in in like freshly fallen snow i don't know if that's i mean it's technically not the same thing fiona hello my dear welcome welcome oh yeah and sand sticks around for a while so maybe the sand the sand angels might be more appropriate and legal so you know Details, details. All right, so it's, it's 8.04, so let's real quick, kind of like normal, 
Do we have anybody new to the reading this evening? If you are, let me know. Bye. <laughs>
that they're going to check everyone's papers. And every man of fighting age, anyone who could be taking part in the resistance, will be imprisoned at Fort National. The bakery reels. He is being caught in spider webs. They twist around his wrists and thighs, crackle like burning paper when he moves. Every second he becomes more entangled. The bell tied to the bakery door jingles and someone enters. Madame Ruel's face seals over like the, vi the visor of a knight clanging down. He nods. Good, she says, and tucks the loaf under his arm. Sea of Flames It is surfaced by hundreds of facets. Over and over, she picks it up, only to set it immediately down, as though it burns her fingers. Her father's arrest, the disappearance of Harold Bazin, the death of Madame Manek. Could this one rock be the cause of so much sorrow? She hears the wheezy, wine-scented voice of old Dr. Jaffard. Queens might have danced all night wearing it. Wars might have been fought over it. The keeper of the stone would live forever, but so long as he kept it, Misfortunes would fall on all those he loved, one after another, in unending rain. Things are just things. Stories are just stories. Surely this pebble is what the German seeks. She ought to fling open the shutters and cast it down onto the street. Give it to someone else, anyone else. Slip out of the house and hurl it into the sea. Etienne climbs the ladder to the attic. She can hear him cross the floorboards above her and turn on the transmitter. She puts the stone in her pocket and picks up the model house and crosses the hall. But before she makes it to the wardrobe, she stops. Her father must have believed it was real. Why else construct the elaborate puzzle box? Why else leave it behind in St. Malo, if not in fear that it could be confiscated during his journey back? Why else leave her behind? It must at least look like a blue diamond worth twenty million francs, real enough to convince Papa. And if it looks real, what will her uncle do when she shows it to him, if she tells him that they ought to throw it into the ocean? She can hear the boy's voice in the museum. When is the last time you saw someone throw five Eiffel Towers into the sea? Who would willingly part with it? And the curse? If the curse is real, and she gives it to him. But curses are not real. Earth is all magma and continental crust and ocean, gravity and time isn't it? She closes her fist, walks into her room, and replaces the stone inside the model house, slides the three roof panels back into place, twists the chimney 90 degrees, and slips the house inside her pocket. Well after midnight, a magnificent high tide arrives, the largest waves smashing against the bases of the ramparts, the sea green and aerated and networked with seething rafts of moonlit foam, Marie Laure comes out of dreams to hear Etienne tapping on her bedroom door. I'm going out. What time is it? Almost dawn. I'll be only an hour. Why do you have to go? It's better if you don't know. What about curfew? I'll be quick. Her great uncle, who has not been quick in the four years she has known him. What if the bombing starts? It's almost dawn, Marie. I should go while it's still dark. Will they hit the houses, uncle? When will they come? They won't hit any houses. Will it be over quickly? Quick as a swallow. You rest, Marie Laure, and when you wake, I'll be back. You'll see. I could read to you a bit, now that I'm awake. We're so close to the end. When I'm back, we'll read. We'll finish it together. She tries to rest her mind, slow her breathing, tries not to think about the little house now under her pillow, and the terrible burden inside. Etienne, Marie Laure whispers, are you ever sorry that we came here? That I got dropped in your lap, and you and Madame Manek had to look after me? Did you ever feel like I brought a curse into your home? Marie Laure, he says without hesitation. He squeezes her hand with both of his. You are the best thing that has ever come into my life. Something seems to be banking up in the silence, a tide, a breaker rearing, but Etienne only says a second time, you rest, and when you wake, I'll be back, and she counts his steps down the stairs. The Arrest of Etienne Leblanc Etienne feels strangely good as he steps outside. He feels strong. 
He is glad Madame Ruel has assigned him this final task. He has already transmitted the location of one air defense battery, a cannon on a shelf of rampart beside the Hotel of Bees. He needs only to take two bearings of more. Find two known points. He'll choose the cathedral spire and the outer island of La, Pit La, La Petite Bay. Then calculate the location of the third and unknown point. Simple triangle. Something other than ghosts on which he can fix his mind. He turns onto the Rue des Tres, skirts behind the college, and makes for the alley behind the Hotel Dieu. His legs feel young, his feet light. No one is about. Somewhere the sun eases up behind the fog. The city in the pre-dawn is warm and fragrant and sleepy, and the houses on either side seem almost immaterial. For a moment, he has a vision that he's walking the aisle of a vast train carriage, all the other passengers asleep. The train gliding through darkness toward a city teeming with light, glowing archways, gleaming towers, fireworks rising. As he approaches the, dull, the dark bulwark of the ramparts, a man in uniform limps toward him out of the blackness. 7th of August, 1944. Marie Laure wakes to the con concussions of big guns firing. She crosses the landing and opens the wardrobe and, with the tip of her cane, reaches through the hanging shirts and raps three times on the false back wall. Nothing. Then she descends to the fifth floor and knocks on Etienne's door. His bed is empty and cool. He's not on the second floor, nor in the kitchen. The penny nail beside the door, where Madame Manek used to hang the key ring, is empty. His shoes are gone. I'll only be an hour. She reigns in her panic. Important not to assume the worst. In the foyer, she checks the tripwire. Intact. Then she tears an end off of yesterday's loaf from Madame Ruel and stands in the kitchen chewing. The water, miraculously, has been turned back on. So she fills the two galvanized buckets and carries them upstairs and sets them in the corner of her bedroom and thinks a moment and walks to the third floor and fills the bathtub to the rim. Then she opens her novel. Captain Nemo has planted his flag on the South Pole, but if he doesn't move the submarine north soon, they will become trapped in ice. The spring equinox has just passed. They face six months of unrelenting night. Marie Laure counts the chapters that remain. Nine. She is tempted to read on, but they are voyaging on the Nautilus together, she and Etienne, and as soon as he returns, they will resume. Any moment now. She rechecks the little house under her pillow and fights the temptation to take out the stone and instead reinstalls the house inside the model city at the foot of her bed. Out the window, a truck roars to life. Gulls pass, braying like donkeys, and in the distance the guns thud again, and the rattling of the truck fades and Marie Laure tries to concentrate on rereading a chapter earlier in the novel. Make the raised dots form letters. The letters, words, the words, a world. In the afternoon, the trip wire quivers, and the bell hidden beneath the third floor table gives a single ring. In the attic high above her, a muted ring matches it. Marie Laure lifts her fingers from the page, thinking, at last. But when she winds down the stairs and sets her hand on the deadbolt and calls, who is there? She hears not the quiet voice of Etienne, but the oily one for, of the perfumer. Claude Lavite. Let me in, please. Even through the door she can smell him. Peppermint, musk, adult, aldehyde. Beneath that, sweat and fear. She undoes both deadbolts and opens the door halfway. He speaks through the half-open gate. You need to come with me. I'm waiting for my great-uncle. I have talked to your great-uncle. You talked to him? Where? Marie Laure can hear Monsieur Levite cracking his knuckles one after the next, his lungs toiling inside his chest. If you could see, Mademoiselle, you'd have seen the, ex the evacuation orders. They've locked the city gates. She does not reply. They're detaining every man between sixteen and sixty. They've been told to assemble at the tower of the chateau. Then they will be marched to Fort National at low tide. God be with them. Out on the Rue Valbrel, Everything sounds calm. Swallows swoop past the houses and two doves bicker on a high gutter. A bicyclist goes rattling past, and then quiet. Have they really locked the city gates? 
Has this man really spoken to Etienne? Will you go with them, Monsieur Levite? I plan not to. You must get to a shelter immediately. Monsieur Levite sniffs. Or to the crypts below Notre Dame at Roquebe, which is where I sent Madame. It's what your uncle asked me to do. Leave absolutely everything behind and come with me now. Why? Your uncle knows why. Everybody knows why. It's not safe here. Come along. But you said the gates to the city are locked. Yes, I did, girl, and that's enough questions for now. He sighs. You are not safe, and I am here to help. Uncle says our cellar is safe. He says if it has lasted for five hundred years, it will last a few more nights. The perfumer clears his throat. She imagines him extending his thick neck to look into the house, the coat on the rack, the crumbs of bread on the kitchen table, everyone checking to see what everyone else has. Her uncle could not have asked the perfumer to escort her to a shelter. When is the last time Etienne had spoken to Claude Levite? Again, she thinks of the model upstairs, the stone inside. She hears Dr. Jaffard's voice. That something so small could be so beautiful, worth so much. Houses are burning at Parame, mademoiselle. They're scuttling ships at the port. They're shelling the cathedral, and there's no water at the hospital. The doctors are washing their hands in wine. Wine! The edges of Monsieur Levite's voice flutter. She remembers Madame Manec saying once that every time a theft was reported in town, Monsieur Levite would go to bed with his billfold stuffed between his buttocks. Marie Larey says, I will stay. Christ, girl, must I force you? She remembers the German pacing outside, Harold Bazin's gate, the edge of his newspaper rattling the bars, and closes the door a fraction. Someone has put the perfumer up to this. Surely, she says, my great uncle and I are not the only people sleeping beneath our own roof tonight. She tries her best to look impassive. Monsieur Levite's smell is overpowering. Mademoiselle, pleading now, be reasonable, come with me, and leave everything behind. You may talk to my great uncle when he returns, and she bolts the door. She can hear him standing out there, working out some cost-benefit analysis. Then he turns and recedes down the street, dragging his fear like a cart behind him. Marie Laure bends beside the hall table and finds the thread and resets the tripwire. What could he have seen? A coat? Half a loaf of bread? Etienne will be pleased. Out past the kitchen window, swift swoop for insects, and the filaments of a spiderweb catch the light and shine for an instant and are gone. And yet, what if the perfumer was telling the truth? The daylight dulls to gold. A few crickets down in the cellar begin their song. A rhythmic cree-cree. Even evening in August, and Marie Laure hikes her tattered stockings and goes into the kitchen and tears another hunk from Madame Ruel's loaf. Leaflets Before dark, the Austrians serve pork kidneys with whole tomatoes on Hotel China. A single silver bee etched on the rim of every plate. Everyone sits on sandbags or ammunition boxes, and Burned falls asleep over his bowl, and Volkheimer talks in the corner with the lieutenant about the radio in the cellar, and around the perimeter of the room the Austrians chew steadily beneath their steel helmets. Brisk, experienced men. Men who do not... When Werner is done with his food, he lets himself into the top-floor suite and stands in the hexagonal bathtub shutter and it opens a few centimeters. The evening air is a benediction. Below the window, on one of the bastioned traces on the seaward side of the hotel, waits the big 88. Beyond the gun, beyond the embrasures, ramparts plunge forty feet to the green and white plumes of surf. To his left waits the city, gray and dense. Far in the east, a red glow rises from some battle just out of sight. The Americans have them pinned against the sea. What's up, Julie? It seems to Werner that in the space between whatever has happened already and whatever is to come hovers an invisible borderland, the known on one side and the unknown on the other. He thinks of the girl who may or may not be in the city behind him. He envisions her running her cane along the runnels. 
facing the world with her barren eyes, her wild hair, and her bright face. At least he protected the secrets of her house. At least he kept her safe. New orders, signed by the garrison commander himself, have been posted on doors and market stalls and lampposts. No person must attempt to leave the old city. No one must walk in the streets without special authority. Just before Werner closes the shutter, a single airplane comes through the dusk. From its belly issues a flock of white, growing slowly larger. Birds? The flock is sundering, scattering. It is paper, thousands of sheets. They gust down the slope of the roof, skitter across the parapets, stick flat in tidal eddies down on the beach. Werner descends to the lobby where an Austrian holds one to the light. It's in French, he says. Werner takes it, the ink so fresh it smudges beneath his fingers. Urgent message to the inhabitants of this town, it says. Depart immediately to open country. The 12th of August, 1944. Entombed. She is reading again. Who could possibly calculate the minimum time required for us to get out? Might we not be asphyxiated before the Nautilus could surface? Was it destined to perish in this tomb of ice, along with all those on board? The situation seemed terrible, but everyone faced it squarely and decided to do their duty to the end. Werner listens. The crew chops through the icebergs that have trapped their submarine. It cruises north along the coast of South America, past the mouth of the Amazon, only to be chased by giant squid in the Atlantic. The propeller cuts out. Captain Nemo emerges from his cabin for the first time in weeks, looking grim. Werner hauls himself off the floor, carrying the radio in one hand and dragging the battery in the other. He traverses the cellar until he finds Volkheimer in the gold armchair. He sets down the battery and runs his hand up the big man's arm to his shoulder, locates his huge head, clamps the headphones over Volkheimer's ears. Can you hear her? says Werner. It's a strange and beautiful story. I wish you could understand French. A giant squid has lodged its giant beak into the propeller of the submarine, and now the captain has said they must surface and fight the beasts hand to hand. Volkheimer draws a slow breath. He does not move. She's using the transmitter where we were supposed to find. I found it, weeks ago. They said it was a network of terrorists, but it was just an old man and a girl. Volkheimer says nothing. You knew all along, didn't you? That I knew? Volkheimer must not be able to hear Werner through the headphones. She keeps saying, help me. She begs her father, her great uncle. She says, he is here. He will kill me. A moan shudders through the rubble above them and in the darkness Werner feels as if he is trapped inside the Nautilus, twenty meters down, while the tentacles of a dozen angry kraken lash its hull. He knows the transmitter must be high in the house, close to the ceiling. He says, I saved her only to hear her die. Volkheimer shows no signs of having understood. Gone or resolved to go, is there much difference? Werner takes back the headphones and sits in the dust beside the battery. The first mate, she reads, struggled furiously with other monsters which were climbing up the sides of the Nautilus. The crew were flailing away with their axes. Ned, Conceal, and I also dug our weapons into their soft bodies. A violent odor of musk filled the air. Fort National Etienne begged his jailers, the guardian of the fort, dozens of his fellow prisoners. My niece, my great niece, she's blind, she's alone. He told them he was 63, not 60, as they claimed, that his papers had been unfairly confiscated, that he was not a terrorist. He wobbled before the Feldwebel in charge and stumbled through the few German phrases he could stitch together. Sie müssen mich helfen. Mein nicht ist Herren dort. But the Feldwebel shrugged like everybody else and looked back at the city burning across the water as if to say, what can anyone do in the face of that? Then the stray American shell struck the fort, and the wounded howled down in the munition cellar, and the dead were buried under rocks just above the tide line, 
and Etienne stopped talking. The tide slips away, then climbs back up. Whatever energy Etienne has left goes into quieting the noise in his head. Sometimes he almost convinces himself that he can see through the smoldering skeletons of the seafront mansions at the northwestern corner of the city to the rooftop of his house. He almost convinces himself if he stands. He almost convinces himself it stands. But then it disappears again behind a mantle of smoke. No pillow. No The latrine is apocalyptic. Food comes irregularly, carried out from the citadel by the guardian's wife across the quarter mile of rock hide, while shells explode in the city behind her. There's never enough. Etienne diverts himself with fantasies of escape, slip over a wall, swim several hundred meters, drag himself through the shore break, scamper across the mined beach with no cover to one of the locked gates. Absurd. Out here, the prisoners see the shells smash into the city before they hear him. They hear them. During the last war, Etienne knew artillerymen who could peer through field glasses and discern their shells damaged by the colors thrown skyward. Gray was stone, brown was soil, pink was flesh. He shuts his eyes. He remembers lamp-lit hours in Monsieur Herbrod's bookshop listening to the first radio he ever heard. He remembers climbing into the, into the choir of the cathedral to listen to Henri's voice as it rose toward the ceiling. He remembers the cramped restaurants with leaded windows and linen fold paneling where his parents took them to dinner, and the corsairs' villas with scalloped friezes and Doric columns and gold coins mortared inside the walls, the storefronts of gunsmiths and shipmasters and money changers and holsters, the graffiti Henri used to scratch into the stones of ramparts. I cannot wait to leave. Fuck this place. He remembers the LeBlanc house. His house. Tall and narrow with the st staircase spiraling up its center like a spiral shell stood on end where the ghost of his brother occasionally slipped between walls where Madame Manek lived and died where not so long ago he could sit on a Davenport with Marie Laray and pretend they flew over the volcanoes of Hawaii over the cloud of over the cloud forests of Peru, where just a week ago she sat cross legged on the floor and read to him about a pearl fishery off the coast of Ceylon. Captain Nemo and Aranax in their diving suits, the impulsive Canadian Ned Land about to hurl his harpoon through the side of a shark. All of it is burning, every memory he ever made. Above Fort National, the dawn becomes deeply, murderously clear. The Milky Way, a fading river. He looks across to the fires, and he thinks, the universe is full of fuel. <laughs> Captain Nemo's Last Words By noon, on the 12th of August, Marie Laure has read seven of the last nine chapters into the microphone. Captain Nemo has freed his ship from the giant squid, only to stare into the eye of a hurricane. Pages later, he rammed a warship full of men, passing through its hull, Vern writes, like a, like a sailmaker's needle through cloth. Now the captain plays a mournful, chilling dirge on his organ as the Nautilus sleeps in the wastelands of the sea. Three pages are left. If Marie Laure has brought anyone comfort by broadcasting the story, if her great-uncle, crouched in some dank cellar with a hundred men, tuned her in, if some trio of Americans reclined in the nighttime fields as they cleaned their weapons and traveled the dark gangways of the Nautilus with her, she cannot say. But she is glad to be so near the end. Downstairs, the German has shouted twice in frustration, then fallen silent. Why not, she considers, just slide through the wardrobe and hand the little house to him and Find out if he will spare her. First, she will finish, and then she'll decide. Again, she opens the model house and tips the stone into her palm. What would happen if the goddess took away the curse? Would the fires go out? Would the earth heal over? Would doves return to the window sills? Would Papa come back? Fill your lungs. Beat your heart. She keeps the knife beside her. Fingertips pressed to the lines of the novel. 
The Canadian harpooner Ned Land has found his window for escape. The sea's bad, he says to Professor Aranax, and the wind's blowing strong. I'm with you, Ned. But let me tell you that if we're caught, I'm going to defend myself, even if I die doing it. We'll die together, Ned, my friend. Marie Laray turns on the transmitter. She thinks of the whelks in Harold Bazin's kennel, ten thousand of them. How they cling, how they draw themselves up into the spirals of their shells. How, when they're tucked into that grotto, the gulls cannot come in to carry them up into the sky and drop them on the rocks to break them. Visitor Von Rumpel drinks from a bottle of skunked wine. He has four days in this house, and how many mistakes he has made. The sea of flames could have been in the Paris Museum all along. That simpering mineralogist and the assistant director laughing as he slunk away, duped, fooled, inveguiled. Or the perfumer could have betrayed him, taking the diamond from the girl after marching her away. Or Levite might have walked her right out of the city while she carried it in her ratty knapsack. Or the old man could have jammed it up his rectum and is now just shitting it out twenty million francs in a pile of feces. Or maybe the stone was never real at all. Maybe it was all a hoax, all story. He had been so certain. Certain he had found the hiding spot, solved the puzzle. Certain the stone would save him. The girl didn't know. The old man was out of the picture. Everything was set up perfectly. What is certain now? Only the murderous bloom inside his body. Only the corruption it brings to every cell. In his ears comes the voice of his father. You are only being tested. Someone calls to him in German. Ist da wer? Father? You in there. Von Rumpel listens. Sounds drawing nearer through the smoke. He crawls to the window, sets his helmet on his head, thrusts his head over the scattered sill. A German infantry, infantry corporal squints up from the street. Sir? I didn't expect... Is the house clear, sir? Empty, yes. Where are you headed, corporal? The fortress at La Cita, sir. We are evacuating, leaving everything. We still hold the Chateau and the Bastion de la Holland. All other personnel are to fall back. Von Rumpel braces his chin on the sill, feeling as if his head might separate from his neck and go tumbling down to explode on the street. The entire town will be inside the bomb line, the corporal says. How long? There will be a ceasefire tomorrow. Noon, they say, to get civilians out. Then they resume the assault. Von Rumpel says we're giving up the city. A shell detonates not far away. In the echoes of the blast, shunt down between the wrecked houses and the soldier in the street claps a hand over his helmet. Bits of stone skitter across the cobbles. He calls, You are with which unit, Sergeant Major? Continue with your work, Corporal. I'm nearly done here. Final sentence. Volkheimer does not stir. The liquid at the bottom of the paint bucket, however toxic it was, is gone. Werner has heard nothing from the girl on any frequency for how long? An hour? More? She read about the Nautilus getting sucked down into a whirlpool, waves higher than houses, the submarine standing on end, its steel ribs cracking. And then she read what he assumed was the last line of the book. Thus, to that question asked 6,000 years ago by Ecclesiastes, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Only two men now have the right to answer, Captain Nemo and myself. Then the transmitter snapped off, and the absolute darkness closed around him. For these past days, how many? It has felt as though the hunger were a hand inside of him, thrusting around in the cavity of his chest, reaching up to his shoulder blades and then down into his pelvis, scraping at his bones. Today, though, today, though or is it tonight? The hunger peters out like a flame for which no fuel remains. Emptiness and fullness in the end, somehow the same. Werner blinks up to see the Viennese girl in her cape descend through the ceiling as if it is no more than a shadow. She carries a paper sack full of withered greens and seats herself amid the rubble. Around her swirls a cloud of bees. 
He can see nothing, but he can see her. She counts on her fingers. For tripping in line, she says. For working too slowly. For arguing over bread. For loitering too long in the camp toilet. For sobbing. For not organizing her things according to protocol. It's surely nonsense, yet something hangs inside it. Some truth he does not want to allow himself to apprehend. And as she speaks, she ages. Silver hair lays down on her head. Her collar frays and she becomes an old woman for his understanding of who hovers at the rim of his consciousness. For complaining of headaches. For singing. For speaking at night in her bunk. For forgetting her birth date during evening muster. For unloading the shipment too slowly. For not turning in her keys correctly. For failing to inform the guard. For rising from bed too late. Frau Schwarzenberger. That's who she is. The Jewess in Frederick's elevator. She runs out of fingers as she counts. For, for closing her eyes while being addressed. For hoarding crusts. For attempting to enter the park. For having inflamed hands. For asking for a cigarette. For a failure of imagination. And in the darkness it feels as if Werner has reached bottom. As if he has been whirling deeper all this time. Like the Nautilus sucked under the maelstrom. Like his father descending into the pits. A one-way dive from Zolverin. Past Schopforta. Past the horrors of Russia and Ukraine. Past the mother and daughter in Vienna. His ambition and shame becoming one and the same to the nadir in his in this basement on the rim of the of the continent where the apparition chants nonsense frau schwarzenberger walks toward him transforming herself as she approaches from woman to girl her hair becomes red again her skin smooths a seven-year-old girl presses her face up against his and in the center of her forehead he can see a hole blacker than the blackness around him at the bottom of which teems a dark city full of souls Ten thousand, five hundred thousand, all these faces staring up from alleys, from windows, from smoldering parks, and he hears thunder. Lightning, artillery, the girl evaporates, the ground quakes, the organs inside his body shake, the beams groan, then the slow trickle of dust and the shallow, defeated breaths of Volkheimer a meter away. Music number one. Sometime after midnight on August 13th, after surviving in her great uncle's attic for five days, Marie Laure holds a record with her left holds a record with her left hand while she runs the fingers of her right gently through its grooves, reconstructing the whole song in her head, each rise and fall. Then she slots the record on the spindle of Etienne's electrophone. No water for a day and a half, no food for two. The attic smells of heat and dust and confinement and her own urine in the shaving bowl in the corner we'll die together ned my friend the siege it seems will never end masonry crashes into the streets the city falls to pieces still this one house does not fall she takes the unopened can out of her great uncle's coat pocket and sets it in the center of the attic floor for so long she has saved it Maybe because it offers some last tie to Madame Manek. Maybe because if she finds it, if she opens it and finds it spoiled, the loss will kill her. She places the can and brick beneath the patio bench, where she knows she can find them again. Then the du she double-checks the record on the spindle, lowers the arm, places the needle at the outer si outside edge, finds the microphone switch with her left hand, the transmitter switch with her right. She is going to turn it up as loud as it will go. If the German is in the house, he will hear. He'll hear piano music draining down through the upper stories and cock his head, and then he'll rove the sixth floor like a slavering demon. Eventually, he'll set, he'll set his ear to the doors of the wardrobe, where it will be louder still. What mazes there are in this world. The branches of trees, the filigree of roots, the matrix of crystals the streets her father recreated in his models, mazes in the nodules on murex shells and in the textures of sycamore bark and inside the hollow bones of eagles, none more complicated than the human brain. 
Etienne would say, what may be the most complex object in existence, one wet kilogram within which spins universes. She places the microphone into the bell-shaped speaker of the electrophone, switches on the record player, and the plate begins to spin. The attic crackles. In her mind, she walks a path in the Jardin des Plantes, the air golden, the wind green, the long fingers of willows drifting across her shoulders. Ahead is her father. He extends a hand, waiting. The piano starts to play. Marie Laure reaches beneath the bench and locates the knife. She crawls along the floor to the top of the seven-rung ladder and sits with her feet dangling in the di and the diamond inside the house in her pocket and the knife in her fist. She says, come and get me. Music number two. Beneath the stars over the city, everything sleeps. Gunners sleep, nuns in a crypt beneath the cathedral sleep. Children in old corsair cellars sleep in the laps of sleeping mothers. The doctor in the basement of the Hotel Dieu sleeps. Wounded Germans in the tunnels below the Fort of La Cita sleep. Behind the walls of Fort National, Etienne sleeps. Everything sleeps, save the snails climbing the rocks and the rats scurrying among the piles. In a hole beneath the ruins of the Hotel of Bees, Werner sleeps too. Only Volkheimer is awake. He sits with the big radio in his lap where Werner has set it and the dying battery between his feet, and static whispering in both ears, not because he believes he will hear anything, but because this is where Werner has left the headphones because he does not have the will to push them off, because he convinced himself hours ago that the plaster heads on the other side of the cellar will kill him if he moves. Impossibly, the static coalesces into music. Volkheimer's eyes open as wide as they can, straining the blackness for every stray photon. A single piano runs up scales, then back down. He listens to the notes, and the silence is between them and then finds himself leading horses through a forest at dawn, trudging through snow behind his great-grandfather, who walks with a saw draped over his huge shoulders, the snow squeaking beneath boots and hooves, all the trees above them whispering and creaking. They reach the edge of a frozen pond, where a pine tree grows as tall as a cathedral. His great-grandfather goes to his knees like a penitent, fits the saw into a groove in the bark, and begins to cut. Volkheimer stands, finds Werner's leg in the darkness, and puts the headphones on Werner's ears. Listen, he says. Listen, listen. Werner comes awake. Chords float past in transparent riffles. Claire de Lune. Claire. A girl so clear you can see right through her. Volkheimer says, hook the light to the battery. Why? Do it. Even before the song has stopped playing, Werner disconnects the radio from the battery, unscrews the bezel and bulb from the dead field light, touches it to the leads, and gives them a sphere of light. At the back of the corner of the cellar, Volkheimer drags blocks of masonry and pieces of timber and shattered sections of wall out of the rubble, stopping now and then only to lean over his knees and catch his breath. He stacks them into a barrier. Then he pulls Werner behind his makeshift bunker unscrews the base of a grenade and yanks the pull cord to ignite the five-second fuse. Werner sets one hand over his helmet and Volkheimer throws the grenade at the place where the stairwell used to be. Music number three. Von Rumpel's daughters were fat, roiling little babies, weren't they? Both of them were always dropping their rattles or rubber pacifiers and tangling themselves in blankets. Why so tortured, little angels? But they grew, despite all his absences. And they could sing, especially Veronica. Maybe they weren't going to be famous, but they could sing well enough to please a father. They'd wear their big felt boots and those awful shapeless dresses their mother made for them. Primroses and daisies embroidered along the collars. And fold their hands behind their backs. And belt out lyrics they were too young to understand. Men cluster to me like moths around a flame, and if their wings burn, I know I'm not to blame. In what might be a memory or a dream, von Rumpel watches Veronica, the early riser, 
kneel on the floor of Marie Laret's room in the pre-dawn darkness, and march a doll in a white gown alongside another in a gray suit down the streets of the model city. They turn left, then right, until they reach the steps of the cathedral, where a third doll waits, dressed in black, one arm raised. Wedding or sacrifice he cannot say. Then Veronica sings so softly that he cannot hear the words, only the melody, less like the sounds made by a human voice and more like the notes made by a piano, and the dolls dance, swaying from foot to foot. The music stops and Veronica vanishes. He sits up. The model at the foot of the bed bleeds away and is a long, long time restoring itself. Somewhere above him, the voice of a young man starts speaking in French about coal. Out. For a split second, the space around Werner tears in half, as though the last molecules of oxygen have been ripped out of it. Then shards of stone and wood and metal streak past, ringing against his helmet, sizzling into the wall behind them, and Volkheimer's barricade collapses, and everywhere in the darkness things scuttle and slide, and he cannot find any air to breathe. But the detonation creates some tectonic shift in the building's rubble, and there is a snap, followed by multiple cascades in the darkness. When Werner stops coughing and pushes the debris off his chest, he finds Volkheimer staring up at a single sheared hole of purple light. Sky. Night sky. A shaft of starlight slices through the dust and drops along the edge of a mound of rubble on the floor. For a moment, Werner inhales it. Then Volkheimer urges him back and climbs halfway up the ruined staircase and begins wailing away at the edges of the hole with a piece of rebar. The iron clangs and his hands lacerate and his six-day beard glows white with dust, but Werner can see that Volkheimer makes quick progress. The sliver of light becomes a violet wedge, wider across than two of Werner's hands. With one more blow, Volkheimer manages to pulverize a big slab of debris, much of it crashing onto his helmet and shoulders, and then it is simply a matter of scrabbling and climbing. He squeezes his upper body through the hole, his shoulders scraping on the edges, his jacket tearing, hips twisting, and then he's through. He reaches down for Werner, his canvas duffel, and the rifle, and pulls them all up. They kneel atop what was once an alley. Starlight hangs over everything. No moon Werner can see. Volkheimer turns his bleeding palms up as though to catch the air, to let it seep into his skin like rainwater. Only two walls of the hotel stand joined at the corner, bits of plaster attached to the inner wall. Beyond it, houses display their interiors to the night. The rampart behind the hotel remains, though many of its embrasures along the top have been shattered. The sea presents a barely audible wash on the other side. Everything else is rubble and silence. Starlight rains into every crenellation. How many men decompose in the piles of stone before them? Nine? Maybe more. They make for the, for the lee of the ramparts, both of them staggering like drunks. When they reach the wall, Volkheimer blinks down at Werner, then out at the night, his face so dusted white he looks like a colossus made of powder. Five blocks to the south. Is the girl still playing her recording? Volkheimer says, take the rifle. Go. And you? Food. Werner rubs his eyes against the glory of the starlight. He feels no hunger, as if he has rid himself forever of the nuisance of eating. But will we go, says Volkheimer again. Werner looks at him a last time, his torn jacket and shovel jaw. The tenderness of his big hands. What you could be. Did he know? All along? Werner moves from cover to cover. Canvas bag in his left hand, rifle in his right. Five rounds left. In his mind, he hears the girl whisper, He is here. He will kill me. West, down a canyon of rubble, scrambling over the bricks and wires and pieces of roof slates, many of them still hot, the streets apparently abandoned, though what eyes might track him from behind shattered windows, German or French or American or British, he cannot say. Possibly the crosshairs of a sniper center on him this very second. Here, a single platform shoe. Here, a fretwork wooden chef on his back, 
holding a board on which remains chalked today's soup. Here, great tangled coils of barbed wire. Everywhere, the reek of corpses. Crouching in the lee of what was a tourist gift shop, a few souvenir plates in their racks, each with a different name painted on the rim and arranged alphabetically, Werner locates himself in the city. Coiffeur d'âme across the street, a bank with no windows, a dead horse attached to its cart. Here and there, an intact building stands without its window glass, the filigreed trails of smoke grown up from its windows, like the shadows of ivy that have been ripped away. What light shines at night? He never knew. Day will blind him. Werner turns right on what he believes is the Rue des Tres. Number four on the Rue Vaubrel still stands. Every window on its façade has been broken, but the walls are hardly scorched. Two of its wooden flower boxes hang on. He is right below me. They said what he needed was certainty, purpose, clarity, that pigeon-chested Commandant Bastien with his grandmother's walk. He said they would strip the hesitation out of him. We are a volley of bullets. We are cannonballs. We are the tip of the sword. Who is the weakest? Wardrobe Von Rumpel wobbles before the mighty cabinet, peers into the old clothes inside. Waistcoats, striped trousers, moth-chewed chambray shirts with tall collars and comically long sleeves. Boys' clothes, decades old. What is this room? The big mirrors on the wardrobe doors are spotted black with age, and the old leather boots stand beneath a little desk, and a whisk broom hangs from a peg. On the desk stands a photograph of a boy in breeches on a beach at dusk. Beyond the broken window hangs a wing windless night, ashes swirling in, in starlight. The voice filtering through the ceiling represents itself. The brain is locked in total darkness, of course, children, and yet the world it constructs, lowering in pitch and warping as the batteries die, the lesson slowing as though the young man is exhausted, and then it stops. Heart galloping, head failing, candle in one hand, pistol in the other, Von Rumpel turns again to the wardrobe, big enough to climb inside. How did such a monstrous thing ever get up to the sixth floor? He brings the candle closer and sees, in the shadows of the hanging shirts, what he missed on previous inspections. Trails through the dust, made by fingers or knees or both. With the barrel of his pistol, he nudges the clothes. How deep does it go? He leans all the way inside, and as he does, he hears a chime, twin bells tinkling both above and below. The sound makes him jerk backward, and he knocks his head on the top of the wardrobe and the candle falls, and Von Rumpel lays, lands on his back. He watches the candle roll, its flame pointing up. Why? What curious principle demands that a candle flame taper always toward the sky? Five days in this house, and no diamond. The last German-controlled port in Brittany lost. The Atlantic Wall with it. Already he has lived beyond the deadline the doctor predicted, and now the tolling of two tiny bells? This is how death comes? The candle rolls gently toward the window, toward the curtains. Downstairs, the door of the house creaks open. Someone steps inside. Comrades. Shattered crockery litters the foyer. Impossible to be noiseless as he enters. A kitchen full of debris waits down a corridor. Hallway deep with drifts of ash. Chair overturned, staircase ahead. Unless she has moved in the past few minutes, she will be high in the house, close to the transmitter. Rifle in both hands, bag over his shoulder, Werner starts up. At each landing, a rushing blackness throws off his vision. Spots open and close at his feet. Books have been thrown down the stairwell, along with papers, cords, bottles and what might be pieces of antique dollhouses. Second floor, third floor, fifth. All in the same state. He has no sense of how much noise he makes or whether it matters. 
On the sixth floor, the stairs appear to end. Three half-open doors frame, frame the landing, one to the left, one ahead, and one to the right. He goes to his right, rifle up. He expects the flash of barrel guns, of gun barrels, the jaws of a demon swinging open. Instead, a broken window illuminates a sway-backed bed. A girl's dress hangs in an armoire. Hundreds of tiny things, pebbles, line the baseboards. Two buckets stand in a corner, half full of what might be water. Is he too late? He props Volkheimer's rifle against the bed and raises a bucket and drinks once, twice. Out the window, far beyond the neighbor neighboring block, beyond the ramparts, the single light of a boat appears and disappears as it rises and falls on distant swells. A voice behind him says, Ah! Werner turns. In front of him totters a German soldier in field dress. The five bars and three diamonds of a sergeant major. Pale and bruised, lean to the point of infirmity, he shambles toward the bed. The right side of his throat spills weirdly above the tightness of his collar. I do not recommend, he says, mixing morphine with Beaujolais. A vein on the side of the man's forehead throbs lightly. I saw you, says Werner, in front of the bakery, with a newspaper. And you, little private, I saw you. In his smile, Werner recognizes an assumption that they are kindred comrades, accomplices, that each has come to this house seeking the same thing. Behind the sergeant major, across the hall, impossibly, flames. A curtain in the room directly across the landing has caught fire. Already flames are licking the ceiling. The sergeant major loops one finger under his collar and pulls against its tightness, his face gaunt and his teeth maniacal. He sits on the bed. Starlight winks off the barrel of his pistol. At the foot of the bed, Werner can just make out a low table upon which scaled-down wooden houses crowd together to form a city. Is it St. Malo? His eyes flash from the model to the flames across the hall to Volkheimer's rifle leaning against the bed. The officer bends forward and looms over the miniature city like some tormented gargoyle. Tendrils of black smoke have begun to snake into the hall. The curtain, sir, it's on fire. The ceasefire is scheduled for noon, or so they say. Von Rumpel says in an empty voice, no need to rush, plenty of time. He jogs the fingers of one hand down a miniature street. We want the same thing, you and I, private, but only one of us can have it, and only I know where it is, which presents a problem for you. Is it here, or here, or here, or here, or here? He rubs his hands together, then lies back on the bed. He points his pistol at the ceiling. Is it up there? In the room beyond the landing, the burning curtain sloughs off its rod. Maybe it will go out, thinks Werner. Maybe it will go out on its own. Werner thinks about the men in the sunflowers and a hundred others, each lay dead in his hut or truck or bunker, wearing the look of someone who had caught the tune of a familiar song, a crease between the eyes, a slackness to the mouth, a look that said, so soon? But doesn't it play for everybody too soon? Firelight plays across the hall. Still on his back, the sergeant major takes the pistol in both hands and opens and closes the breech. Drink some more, he says, gest and gestures toward the bucket in Werner's hands. I can see how thirsty you are. I didn't pee in it, I promise. Werner sets down the bucket. The sergeant major sits up and tilts his head back and forth as though working out kinks in his neck. Then he aims his gun at Werner's chest. From down the hall, in the direction of the burning curtain, comes a muted clattering something bouncing down a ladder and striking the floor. And the sergeant major's attention swings toward the noise, and the barrel of his pistol dips. Werner lunges for Volkheimer's rifle. All your life you wait, and then it finally comes. And are you ready? The simultaneous... Oh, uh, Lisa, we are reading All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Dower. If you're still here. <laughs> and we are currently on page 466, in case you happen to have the book. 
the simultaneity of instants. The brick claps onto the floor. The voices stop. She can hear a scuffle, and then the shot comes like a breach of crimson light. The eruption of Krakatoa. The house briefly riven in two. Marie Laray half slides, half falls down the ladder and presses her ear against the false back of the wardrobe. Footsteps hurry across the landing and enter Henri's room. There is a splash and a hiss, and she smells smoke and steam. Now the footsteps become hesitant. They are different from the sergeant major's. Lighter, stepping, stopping. Opening the doors of the wardrobe. Thinking, figuring it out. She can hear a light rushing sound as he runs his fingers along the back of the wardrobe. She tightens her grip on the handle of the knife. Three blocks to the east, Frank Volkheimer blinks as he sits in a devastated apartment on the corner of the Rue Laurier and the Rue Thenvard, eating from a tin of sweet yams with his fingers. Across the river mouth beneath four feet of concrete, an aide holds open the garrison commander's jacket as the colonel swings one arm through one sleeve, than the other. At precisely the same moment, a 19-year-old American scout climbing the hillside toward the pillboxes stops and turns and reaches an arm down for the soldier behind him, while, with his cheekbone pressed to a granite paver at Fort National, Etienne LeBlanc decides that if he and Marie Laure live through this, whatever happens, he will let her pick a place on the equator and they will go, book a ticket, ride a ship, fly an airplane, until they stand together in a rainforest, surrounded by flowers they've never smelled, listening to birds they've never heard. Three hundred miles away from Fort National, Reinhold von Rumpel's wife wakes her daughters to go to Mass and contemplates the good looks of her neighbor who has returned from the war without one of his feet. Not all that far from her, Yuta Fenning sleeps in the ultramarine shadows of the girls' dormitory and dreams of light thickening and settling across a field like snow. And not all that far from Yuta. The Fiora raises a glass of warm, but never boiled, milk to his lips, a slice of Oldenburg black bread on his plate, and a whole apple beside it, his daily breakfast, while in a ravine outside of Kiev, two inmates rub their hands in sand because they have become slippery, and then they take up the stretcher again while a... S Sonder Commando stirs the fire below them with a steel pole. A wagtail flits from flagstone to flagstone in a courtyard in Berlin, searching for snails to eat, and at the, Na the Napola school at Schulpforta, 119 12 and 13-year-olds wait in a queue behind a truck to be handed 30-pound anti-tank landmines, boys who, in almost exactly eight months, marooned amid the Russian advance, the entire school cut off like an island will be given a box of the Reich's last bitter chocolate and wire-marked helmets salvaged from dead soldiers, and then this final harvest of the nation's youth will rush out with the chocolate melting in their guts and over-large helmets bobbing on their shorn heads and sixty, 60 Panzerfaust rocket launchers in their hands in a last spasm of futility to defend a bridge that no longer requires defending while T-34 tanks from the White Russian Army come clicking and rumbling toward them to destroy them all, every last child. Dawn in St. Malo, and there is a, is a twitch on the other side of the wardrobe. Werner hears Marie Laure inhale. Marie Laure hears Werner scrape three fingernails across the wood, a sound not unlike the sound of a record coursing beneath the surface of a needle. Their faces and arms reach apart. He says, Es tu la? Are you there? He is a ghost. He is from some other world. He is Papa, Madame Manek, Etienne. He is everyone who has left her finally coming back. Through the panel, he calls, I am not killing you. I am hearing you on radio. It's why I come. He pauses, fumbling to translate. The song, Light of the Moon? She almost smiles. We all come into existence as a single cell, smaller than a speck of dust, much smaller. Divide, multiply, add and subtract. Matter changes hands, atoms flow in and out. Molecules pivot, proteins stitch together. 
mitochondria send out their oxidi oxidative dictates, we begin as a microscopic electrical swarm. The lungs, the brain, the heart. Forty weeks later, six trillion cells get crushed in the vice of our mother's birth canal and we howl. Then the world starts in on us. Marie Laure slides open the wardrobe. Werner takes her hand and helps her out. Her feet find the floor of her grandfather's room. Mes souliers, she says, I have not been able to find my shoes. Second can. <clears throat> the girl sits very still in the corner and wraps her coat around her knees, the way she tucks her ankles up against her bottom, the way her fingers flutter through the space around her, each a thing he hopes never to forget. Guns boom to the east, the citadel being bombarded again, the citadel bombarding back. Exhaustion breaks over him. In French, he says, there will be a... a... Waffenru stopping in the fighting at noon so people can get out of the city i can get you out and you know this is true no he says i do not know it is true quiet now he examines his trousers his dusty coat the uniform makes him an accomplice in everything this girl hates there is water he says and crosses to the other sixth floor room and does not look at von rumpel's body in her bed and retrieves the second bucket. Her whole head disappears inside its mouth, and her stick-like arms hug its sides as she gulps. He says, you are very brave. She lowers the bucket. What is your name? He tells her. She says, when I lost my sight, Werner, people said I was brave. When my father left, people said I was brave. But it is not bravery. I have no choice. I wake up and live my life. Don't you do the same? He says, not in years, but today. Today, maybe I did. Her glasses are gone, and her pupils look like they are full of milk, but strangely, they do not unnerve him. He remembers a phrase of Frau Elena's belled. Beautiful, ugly. What day is it? He looks around. Scorched curtains and soot fanned across the ceiling, and cardboard peeling off the window, and the very first pale light of pre-dawn leaking through. I don't know. It's morning. A shell screams over the house. He thinks, I only want to sit here with her for a thousand years. But the shell detonates somewhere, and the house creaks, and Werner says, There was a man who used that transmitter you have, who broadcast lessons about science. When I was a boy, I used to listen to them with my sister. That was my the voice of my grandfather. You heard him? Many times. We loved them. The window glows. The slow, sandy light of dawn permeates the room. Everything transient and aching. Everything tentative. To be here in this room, high in this house, out of the cellar, with her, it is like medicine. I could eat bacon, she says. What? I could eat a whole pig. He smiles. I could eat a whole cow. The woman who used to live here, the housekeeper, she made the most wonderful omelets in the world. When I was little, he says, or hopes he says, we used to pick berries by the ruher. My sister and me. Berries as big as our thumbs. The girl crawls into the wardrobe and climbs a ladder and comes back down clutching a dented tin can. Can you see what this is? There's no label. I didn't think there was. Is it food? Let's open it and find out. With one stroke from the brick, he punctures the can with the tip of the knife. Immediately he can smell it. The perfume is so sweet, so outrageously sweet that he nearly faints. What is the word? Peches? Le peches? The girl leans forward. The freckles seem to bloom across her cheeks as she inhales. We will share, she says, for what you did. He hammers the knife in a second time, saws away at the metal, and bends up the lid. Careful, he says, as he passes it to her. She dips in two fingers and digs up a wet, soft, slippery thing. Then he does the same. 
That first peach slithers down his throat like rapture, a sunrise in his mouth. They eat. They drink the syrup. They run their fingers around the inside of the can. Birds of America What wonders in this house? She shows him the transmitter in the attic, its double battery, its old-fashioned electrophone, the hand-machined antenna that can be raised and lowered along the chimney by an ingenious system of levers, even a phonograph record that she says contains her grandfather's voice, lessons in science for children, and the books. The lower floors are blanketed with them. Becquerel, Lavoisier, Fisher, a lifetime of reading. What it would be like to spend ten years in this small, in this tall, narrow house, shuttered from the world, studying its secrets, and reading its volumes, and looking at this girl. Do you think, he asks, that Captain Nemo survived the whirlpool? Marie Laray sits on the fifth floor landing in her oversized coat, as though waiting for a train. No, she says. Yes, I don't know. I suppose that is the point, no? To make us wonder? She cocks her head. He was a madman, and yet I didn't want him to die. In the corner of her great-uncle's study, amid a tumult of, tumult of books, he finds a copy of Birds of America, a reprint not nearly as large as the one he saw in Frederick's living room, but dazzling nonetheless, 435 engravings. He carries it out to the landing. Has your uncle shown you this? What is it? Birds. Bird after bird after bird. Outside, shells fly back and forth. We must get lower in the house, she says, but for a moment they do not move. California partridge, common gannet, frigate pelican. Werner can still see Frederick kneeling at his window, nose to the glass, little gray bird hopping about in the bows. Doesn't look like much, does it? Could I keep a page from this? Why not? We will leave soon. No, when it is safe. At noon. How will we know when it's time? When they stop shooting. Airplanes come, dozens and dozens of them. Werner shivers uncontrollably. Marie Laure leads him to the first floor where ash and soot lie a half inch deep over everything. Hello, Mrs. Zora. Or, sir, apologies. <laughs> and he pushes the capsized furniture out of the way and hauls open the cellar door and they climb down. Somewhere above, thirty bombers let fly their payloads, and Werner and Marie Laurie feel the bedrock shake, hear the detonations across the river. Could he, by some miracle, keep this going? Could they hide here until the war ends, until the armies finish marching back and forth above their heads, and until all they have to do is push open the door and shift some stones aside, and the house has become a ruin beside the sea. Until he can hold her fingers in his palms and lead her out into the sunshine. He would walk anywhere to make it happen, bear anything, in a year or three years or ten. France and Germany would not mean what they mean now. They could leave the house and walk to a tourist restaurant and order a simple meal together and eat it in silence the comfortable kind of silence lovers are supposed to share. Do you know, Marie Lore asks in a gentle voice, why he was here, that man upstairs? Because of the radio? Even as he says it, he wonders. Maybe, she says, maybe that's why. In another minute, they're asleep. Oh, miss, I'm so sorry, dear. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. Cease fire. Gritty summer light spills through the open trap door into the cellar. It might already be afternoon, no guns firing. For a few heartbeats, Werner watches her sleep. Then they hurry. He cannot find the shoes she asks for, but he finds a pair of men's loafers in a closet and helps her put them on. Over his uniform, he pulls on some of Etienne's tweed trousers, along with a shirt whose, leaves, whose sleeves are too long. If they run into Germans, he will speak only French, 
say he is helping her leave the city. If they run into Americans, he will say he's deserting. There will be a collection point, he says, somewhere they're gathering refugees, though he's not sure he says it correctly. He finds a white pillowcase in an upturned cabinet and folds it into her coat pocket. When it comes time, hold this as high as you can. I will try. And my cane? Here. In the foyer, they hesitate, neither sure what waits on the other side of the door. He remembers the overheated dance hall from the entr entrance exams four years before. Ladder nailed to the wall, crimson flag with its white circle and black cross below. You step forward, you jump. Outside, mountains of rubble hunker everywhere. Chimneys stand with their bricks raw to the light. Smoke troweled across the sky. He knows that the shells have been coming from the east, that six days ago the Americans were almost to Parame, so he moves Marie Loret in that direction. Any moment they will be seen, either by Americans or his own army, and made to do something. Work, join, confess, die. From somewhere comes the sound of fire, the sound of dried roses being crumbled in a fist. No other sounds, no motors, no airplanes, no distant pop of gunfire or howling of wounded men or yapping of dogs. He takes her hand to help her over the piles. No, shelf, no shells fall and no rifles crack, and the light is soft and shot through with ash. Utah, he thinks, I finally listened. For two blocks, they see nobody. Maybe Volkheimer is eating. This is what Volkheimer would like to imagine. This is what Werner would like to imagine. Gigantic Volkheimer, eating by himself at a little table with a view of the sea. It's so quiet. Her voice, like a bright, clear window of sky. Her face, a field of freckles. He thinks, I don't want to let you go. Are they watching us? I don't know. I don't think so. A block ahead, he sees movement. Three women carrying bundles. Marie Lare pulls at his sleeve. What is this cross street here? The Rue des Lauriers? Come, she says, and walks with her cane tapping back and forth in her right hand. They turn right and left, past a walnut tree like a giant charred toothpick jammed into the ground, past two crows picking at something unidentifiable, until they reach the base of the ramparts. Airborne creepers of ivy hang from an archway over a narrow alley. Far to his right, Werner can see a woman in blue taffeta drag a great overstuffed suitcase over a curbstone. A boy in pants meant for a younger child follows, beret thrown back on his head, some kind of shiny jacket on. There are civilians leaving, Mademoiselle. Shall I call to them? I need only a moment. She leads him deeper down the alley. Sweet, unfettered ocean air pours through a gap in the wall he cannot see. The air throbs with it. At the end of the alley, they, eat, they reach a narrow gate. She reaches inside her coat and produces a key. Is the tide high? He can just see through the gate into a low space, bounded by a grate on the far side. There is water down there. We have to hurry. But she is already passing through the gate and descending into the grotto in her big shoes, moving with confidence, running her fingers along the walls, as though they are old friends and she thought she might never might never see them again. The tide pushes a low riffle through the pool and it washes over her shins and dampens the hem of her dress. From her coat, she takes some small wooden thing and sets it in the water. She speaks lightly, her voice echoing. You need to tell me, is it in the ocean? It must be in the ocean. It is in, we must go, Mademoiselle. Are you certain it's in the water? Yes. She climbs out, breathless, pushes him back through the gate and locks it behind him. He, stand, he hands, her her, hands her the cane. Then they head back down the alley, her shoes squelching as she goes. Out through the hanging ivy, turn left, straight ahead a ragged stream of people crosses an intersection. A woman, a child, two men carrying a third on a stretcher all three with cigarettes in their mouths. The darkness returns to Werner's eyes, and he feels faint. Soon his legs will give out. A cat sits in the road, licking a paw and smoothing it over its ears and watching him. 
He thinks of the old broken miners he'd see in Zolverin, sitting in chairs or on crates, not moving for hours, waiting to die. To men like that, time was a surfeit. Time was a surfeit, a barrel they watched slowly drain. When really he thinks it's a glowing puddle you carry in your hands, you should spend all your energy protecting it, fighting for it, working so hard not to spill one single drop. Now, he says, in the clearest French he can muster, here's the pillowcase. You run your hand along the wall. Can you feel it? You reach an inter intersection. Keep going straight. The street looks mostly clear. Keep the pillowcase high, right out in front like this. Do you understand? She turns to him and chews her bottom lip. They will shoot. Not with that white flag. Not a girl. There are others ahead. Follow this wall. He sets her hand against it a second time. Hurry. Remember the pillowcase. And you? I will go in the other direction. She turns her face toward his, and, though she cannot see him, he feels he cannot bear her gaze. Won't you come with me? It will be better for you if no one sees you with me. But how will I find you again? I don't know. She reaches for his hand and sets something in his palm, and squeezes his hand into a fist. Goodbye, Werner. Goodbye, Marie Laray. Then she goes. Every few paces the tip of her cane strikes a broken stone in the street, and it takes a while to pick her way around it. Step, pause, step. Step, pause, step, step, again. Her cane testing, the wet hem of her dress swinging, the white pillowcase held aloft. He does not look away until she is through the intersection, down the next block, and out of sight. He waits to hear voices, guns. They will help her. They must. When he opens his hand, there is a little iron key in his palm. Chocolate. Madame Ruel finds Marie Laure that evening in a requisitioned school. She grips her hand and does not let go. The civil affairs people have stacked a confiscated German chocolate, have stacks of confiscated German chocolate in the rectangular cartons, and Marie Laure and Madame Ruel eat too many to count. In the morning, the Americans take the chateau and the last anti-air battery and free the prisoners held at Fort National. Madame Ruel pulls Etienne out of the processing queue, and he wraps Marie Laure in his arms. The colonel in his underground fortress cross the river, across the river holds out, for three more days, until an American airplane, called a lightning, drops a tank of napalm through an air vent, one shot in a million, and five minutes later, a white sheet comes up on a pole, and the siege of St. Malo is over. Sweet platoons remove all of the incendiary devices they can, they can find, and army photographers go in with their tripods, and a handful of citizens return from farms and fields and cellars to drift through the ruined streets. On August 25th, Madame Ruel is allowed back into the city to check on the condition of the bakery, but Etienne and Marie Laurier travel in the other direction, toward Rains, where they book a room at a hotel called The Universe with a functioning boiler, and each takes a two-hour bath. In the window glass at night, as night falls, he watches her reflection, feel its way he watches her reflection feel its way toward the bed her hands press against her face then fall away we'll go to paris he says i've never been you can show it to me light werner is captured a mile south of saint malo by three french resistance fighters in street clothes roving through the streets in a lorry First, they believe they have rescued a little white-haired old man. Then they hear his accent, notice the German tunic beneath the antique shirt, and decide they have a spy, a fabulous catch. Then they realize Werner's youth. Then they hand him off to an American clerk in a requisitioned hotel transformed into a disarmament center. At first, Werner worries they're taking him downstairs. Please, not another pit. 
but he is brought to the third floor, where an exhausted interpreter, who has been booking German prisoners for a month, notes his name and rank, then asks a few, a few rote questions while the clerk rifles through Werner's canvas duffel and hands it back. A girl, Werner says in French, did you see? But the interpreter only smirks and says something to the clerk in English, as though every German soldier he has interviewed asked about a girl. He's ushered into a courtyard encircled with razor wire, where eight or nine other Germans sit in their high boots holding battered canteens, one dressed in women's clothes in which he apparently tried to desert, two NCOs and three privates and no Volkheimer. At night they serve soup in a cauldron and he gulps down four helpings from a tin cup. Five minutes later he is sick in the corner. The soup won't stay down in the morning either. Shoals of clouds swim through the sky. His left ear admits no sound. He lingers over the images of Marie Laurent, her hands, her hair, even as he worries that to concentrate on them too long is to risk wearing them out. A day after his arrest, he is marched east in a group of twenty to join a larger group where they are penned in a warehouse. Through the open doors, he cannot see St. Malo, but he hears the airplanes, hundreds of them, and a great pall of smoke hangs over the horizon day and night. Twice, medics try giving Werner bowls of gruel, but it will not stay down. He's been able to keep nothing in his stomach since the peaches. Maybe his fever is returning. Maybe the sludge they drank in the hotel cellar has poisoned him. Maybe his body is giving up. If he does not eat, he understands he will die. But when he does eat, he feels as if he will die. From the warehouse, they are marched to Dinan. Most of the prisoners are boys or middle-aged men, the shattered remains of companies. They carry ponchos, duffels, crates, a few tote, brightly colored suitcases claimed from who knows where. Among them walk pairs of men who fought side by side, but most are strangers to one another. And all have seen things they wish to forget. Always there is the sense of a tide behind them, rising, gathering mass, carrying with it a slow and vindictive rage. He walks in the tweed trousers of Marie Laure's great-uncle. Over his shoulder he carries his duffel, eighteen years old. All his life, his schoolmasters, his radio, his leaders talk to him about the future. And yet what future remains? The road ahead is blank, and the lines of his thoughts all incline inward. He sees Marie Laurie disappear down the street with her cane, like ash blown about in a fire, and a feeling of longing crashes against the underside of his ribs. On the 1st of September, Werner cannot get to his feet when he wakes. Two of his fellow prisoners help him to the bathroom and back, then lay him in the grass. A young Canadian in a medic's helmet shines a penlight into Werner's eyes and loads him into a truck and he is driven some distance and set in a tent full of dying men. A nurse puts fluid into his arm, spoons a solution into his mouth. For a week he lives in the strange greenish light beneath the canvas of that huge tent, his duffel clutched in one hand and the hard corners of the little wooden house clamped in the other. When he has the strength, he fiddles with it, twists the chimney, slide off the three panels of the roof, look inside, built so cleverly. Every day, on his right and left, another soul escapes toward the sky, and it sounds to him as if he can hear faraway music, as if a door has been shut on a grand old radio, and he can listen on only by putting his good ear against the material of his cot, although the music is soft and there are moments when he is not certain it is there at all. There is something to be angry at, Werner is sure, but he Cannot say what it is. Won't eat, says a nurse in English. Armband of a medic. Fever? Hi. There are more words than numbers. In a dream he sees a bright crystalline night with the canals all frozen and the lanterns of the miners' houses burning and the farmers skating between the fields. He sees a submarine asleep in the lightless depths of the Atlantic. Yuta presses her face to a porthole and breathes on the glass. He half expects to see Volkheimer's huge hand appear, help him up, and clap him into the opel. And Marie Laurie? 
Can she still feel the pressure of his hand against the webbing between her fingers, as he can feel hers? One night he sits up. In cots around him are a few dozen sick or wounded. A warm September wind pours across the countryside and sets the walls of the tent rippling. Werner's head swivels lightly on his neck. The wind is strong and gusting stronger, and the corners of the tent strain against their guy ropes where the flaps at the two ends come up. He can see trees buck and sway. Everything rustles. Werner zips his old notebook and the little house into his duffel, and the man beside him murmurs questions to himself, and the rest of the ruined company sleeps. Even Werner's thirst has faded. He only feels the raw, impassive surge of the moonlight as it strikes the tent above him and scatters. Out there, through the open flaps of the tent, clouds hurtle above treetops, toward Germany, toward home. Silver and blue, blue and silver. Sheets of paper tumble down the rows of cots, and in Werner's chest comes a quickening. He sees Frau Elena kneel beside the coal stove and bank up the fire, children in their beds. Baby Yuta sleeps in her cradle. His father lights a lamp, steps into an elevator, and disappears. The voice of Volkheimer. What you could be. Werner's body seems to have gone weightless under his blanket, and beyond the flapping tent doors the trees dance and the clouds keep up their huge billowing march, and he swings first one leg and then the other off the edge of the bed. Ernst, says the man beside him, Ernst. But there is no Ernst. The men in the cots do not reply. The American soldier at the door of the tent sleeps. Werner walks past him into the grass. The wind moves through his undershirt. He is a kite, a balloon. Once, he and Yuta built a little sailboat from scraps of wood and carried it to the river. Yuta painted the vessel in ecstatic purples and greens, and she set it on the water with great formality. But the boat sagged as soon as the current got a hold of it. It floated downstream, out of reach, and the flat black water swallowed it. Yuta blinked at Werner with wet eyes, pulling at the battered loops of yarn in her sweater. It's all right, he told her. Things only hardly ever work on the first try. We'll make another, a better one. Did they? He hopes they did. He seems to remember a little boat, a more seaworthy one, gliding down a river. It sailed around a bend and left them behind. Didn't it? The moonlight shines and billows. The broken clouds scud above the trees. Leaves fly everywhere. But the moonlight stays unmoved by the wind, passing through clouds, through air, in what seems to Werner like impossibly slow, imperturbable rays. They hang across the buckling grass. Why doesn't wind move the light? Across the field, an American watches a boy leave the sick tent and move against the background of trees. He sits up. He raises his hand. Stop, he calls. Halt, he calls. But Werner has crossed the edge of the field, where he steps on a trigger landmine set there by his own army three months before and disappears in a fountain of earth. And with that, we will call our reading to a close this evening. I told you guys it was going to get rough. I hate that part. I hate that part the most out of all of this, I think. This whole story. I dreaded that part. <laughs> I really did. But the end is nigh, my dears. The end of our book is almost there. So little left. <laughs> So how is everyone doing with the story so far? Is everyone okay? <laughs> oh, thank you, Miss Linda. Thank you so much. Did everyone bear with me?
I will say probably, I'll say uh, Friday, our Friday reading. We'll, we'll bring this story to a close. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Cece. Thank you so much. All right. So, oh, thank you. Thank you for the rose. Thank you so much. Um, oh, that's okay, Fiona. <laughs> yeah, I know that, that was, that was a hard ending. I know, Miss Deborah. I know. Um, so, okay. Uh, guys, I'm, I'm going to sign off for now. Um, Friday, same time, eight to nine 30 ish. We ran a little long this time, but that's okay. Eight to nine 30 on Friday. And we will finish up all the light we cannot see. And then next week we'll move on to a new book. So, um, I hope you all have a good evening. Um, stay hydrated. There's water in here, I promise. Um, oh, that's okay. So, Siren, um, I will have this. I will have this reading uploaded by tomorrow. Um, so, you know, if you if you haven't been able to um, be around for all of the readings, they're on my YouTube page. You can find my YouTube page where I also have all of my Nikki content. I've uploaded since this whole TikTok potentially being banned thing. Um, I'm just preemptively moving as much of all of my Nikki content, at least to my YouTube page for right now and, and my book readings. So you can at least find that on my YouTube. And, um, I, I hope they don't get rid of TikTok, but I mean, if they do, we'll just find some other new app to use. So all right, guys, have a good night, and I will see you all on Friday. Mwah.